In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt receive the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Saint Terry. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Father. Okay, we've entered into the fourth week of our spiritual exercise program, and we're building a uh, New York edifice, if I can use that word, no? Because we don't have big edifices here in California, but New York, the, you, we've got them, no? And this uh, edifice has ten different stories. So the foundation is we have to know why we're here. We don't want to have what's called an identity crisis, right? It'll be like a chicken with his head cut off. He's going to be going nowhere fast and run out of gas, right? <laughs> okay. So we're here to praise God, reverence God, serve God, by means of that to save our soul. <coughs> then we had to encounter our major obstacle, which is that of sin. So we meditate upon the triple sin that of the angels, that of Adam and Eve, uh, not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve, and one soul that was lost because of one mortal sin. Then um, we meditated upon last week some of your favorite topics, timely topics that could be <laughs> utilized during your Christmas Eve meals and your... <laughs> New Year's meals, right? Uh, that would um, wake people up if they're yawning. And if they're having a highball, they'll get even higher with that highball. Huh? <laughs> and that means death, judgment, heaven, <coughs> hell, and purgatory. purgatory. Mm -hmm. With embellished or impermeated with the idea of eternity, which means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And you all, uh, you all uh, utilizing your Ignatian contemplative apparatus, if I could use that terminology, you imagine your own death, as well as you imagine yourself planted in the depths of hell. I hope you did that. Now, I know it's challenging, and uh, you uh, probably want to get in the pogo stick, as we used to use in the 60s, and jump over that like a kangaroo, right? <clears throat> I used to be able to go up and down stairs with a pogo stick without any hands. I'm a pretty good athlete, huh? <laughs> when I was about 13 or 14, no? So uh, we don't want to be pogo jumping over hell because we may trip and end up slipping into it and I'd never get out of it, right? So better meditate upon it now uh, in time than to have that as our, our eternal destiny. St. Faustina said to... Um, in, the, in the meditation on hell, which you read, her reflection, she noticed that all those that were in hell actually denied the existence of hell. See, that's a pretty interesting observation, right? Those who were in hell said hell did not exist. So, um, hell does exist. <clears throat> Maybe you've read some of the existential philosophical writers of the 
early 20th century, Jean-Paul Sartre, <coughs> Albert Camus, he said, my, my brother is my hell. Uh, we don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you read, you've read Jean-Paul Sartre in high school or college, no? No, we believe that there's a, the, 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 hell is a real place, no? You might feel that it's, it's hellish living with cer certain individuals. They may feel the same thing with you, right? But hell is a real place where people go who die in the state of mortal sin without repentance. Amen or oh me? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to be going from, uh, get, we've been meditating upon the reality of sin outside ourselves. Now we're going to be going into our inner world, our own microcosmos, if I can use that Greek term. And we're going to be meditating upon what are called the capital sins. You hear me? Yes. The capital sins. It's a fascinating topic uh, because once I go through them, we all can identify with these capital sins within our own lives, one more than another. So let's give you the origin, the origin, the number, and the definition and the opposite virtue, as Dante presents in Purgatory. Robert Barron did a masterful presentation of that, one of his talks when he was a priest, no? All of his talks, that was, I think, one of the best I've ever heard, no? Where do the capital sins come from? They come from original sin. They come from original sin. So, coming into the world with original sin, we all have the reality of capital sins within us. And the definition of a capital sin, it's not a, an actual sin unless you act on it. Capital sins uh, are they're, uh, bad tendencies we have within us. There are bad proclivities, if you like that word. There are bad inclinations. And they, they, Thomas Aquinas, you're probably learning there at Ave Maria, calls it concupiscence, okay? Or fomi peccati in the Latin. There are certain tendencies that pull us away from God. St. Paul speaks about the battle between the flesh and the spirit. In Romans, no? If you like another image, uh, an image from the New Yorkers. Uh, in New York, what we do is we have what's called a tug of war. You ever do a tug of war? In tug of war, you got a big rope here. You got five boys here, and five boys on the other side of the rope. In the middle, you got a mud puddle with an uh, alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a crocodile if you prefer, right? if you're from Florida, huh? And you're, you're being pulled, you're being pulled in the wrong direction. You're being pulled towards sin. And if we don't put a halt on that, and then we, we're pulled into the mud. And we can get close to the crocodile, too. So make sure that we. Don't allow ourselves to be pulled into that mud. Now the number. Classically, there's been seven capital sins. And you who are literary masters probably know that probably the greatest writer on this is a saint. You probably never heard of him. It's John Cashin. Saint John Cashin. And Aquinas took him and kind of synthesized it. So if you Google in John Cashin, you see, you're going to see um, page after page after page of explanation of these, um, these capital sins. Thomas Aquinas would probably be the best one to read if you wanted 
read it in a more uh, synthetic, summarized fashion. But we're going we're gonna to even give you an even more synthesized fashion in the, the Tan Publisher booklet, The Seven Capital Sins. Yes? Good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, sometimes they have eight or even nine. Uh, the, do you know the eight, the eighth and nine would be that of val vanity and melancholy? Okay, vanity and melancholy. Well, here's a good question related to this topic um, because we're in Adventist season, which we're doing a little bit of penance. Is it uh, a lot of women here? Is it is it uh, Wrong to put makeup on. What do you think? What do you think the Protestants say? Yeah. What do you think? No? You think it's wrong? It's a perfection for the skin. Okay. It's not too much makeup, but it's too much skin. No, but I'll, let, me, let me respond. You arrive at a certain age, if you don't put it on, it would be a sin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you fell into my trap, okay? <laughs> you kind of look like Santa Claus. You look like a Christmas tree without the, uh, the star on top of it. <laughs> it's interesting that Fulton Sheen says that it, it can, you can go overboard. He says the more the more a person decks himself out of her, the less he has within. It's interesting. And manifest safe in an interior poverty, no? Fulton Sheen, no? Not to say that you can't, but if you're overdoing it, you know, you look like a Christmas tree. I mean, you, you know, your, your husband gives you a, a little hug and you, you can't, there's too much power to there. You have to get like a sandpaper. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be going through, we're not going to be going through vanity and melancholy. We'll go through the, the other seven. Uh, I'll give you the seven. I, div I divide them into my own category. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through them quickly, and God willing, we'll spend time on the capital sin of the of the present epoch in which we live. I really feel I have to do justice to one of them because it's the it's the biggie in this country, in Europe, and other places too. So let's uh, let's. Uh, Let's get to know the capital sins. You want to be begging for the grace of self-knowledge to see what's your capital sin. And then to, to practice the opposite virtue. I just want to give you a little bit of Dante. Okay? What is the capital sin and uh, how can we practice the opposite virtue? So the first four are related to our corporal nature. Our body. The third, the other, the other three are related more to our intellectual nature, and they are. Are you listening? Yes. Okay. The first is gluttony. You hear the word gluttony? Mm -hmm. Spanish la gula, la gula. <laughs> and lust. Then, greed, sometimes mentioned as avarice, right? Then, laziness, sometimes, uh, sometimes said as sloth. Spanish, la flojera. See how Espanol, la vagancia. La vagancia es la madre de todos los dice. Ah, madre tiene que obedecerlo. <laughs> then you've got uh, envy. It's a little bit different than jealousy. Unless you have your degree in theology, you probably know, don't know the minute distinction. And then, anger. Are you a Kodahuda? <laughs> anger. And that what is at the root of all the capital sins is that of pride. 
pride goes before the fall, my dad would always teach us as kids, no? Or we fall, there's usually pride involved in it. So the first three, four rather, gluttony, lust, avarice, and sloth are related to our body. We have to tame the old man, as St. Francis would say. No? Conquer the flesh, right? Either we conquer the flesh and we experience the freedom of the sons and daughters of God, we become slaves to the flesh. No? A lot of people there are slaves. <clears throat> the other three are related more to our intellectual nature, that of envy, anger, and pride. So let's go through them. I'd like to give you uh, some definitions and then um, give you the conscious. I want to hone in on one, which is the sin of the century. Gluttony. What the heck is that? The American society, Father. Well, sure. Yeah. This is a very gluttonous society because we have so much abundance here, right? Uh, if you ever go to the Philippines, you go to Mexico or other places, or Vietnam, you know, <laughs> you have food. Everywhere you go here, there's malls and restaurants and pizza parlors, right? No? So there's a real abundance here. Uh, could I give you a definition of gluttony? Could I? You give me permission? Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Gluttony is a, is a desire, disordered desire to eat and drink. You should underline the word disorder. Mm -hmm. It's a disordered desire to eat and drink. Disordered desire to eat and drink. Here's a question. Do you eat to live or live to eat? Thanksgiving, <laughs> Christmas, New Year's, hello. <clears throat> now, it's a good one-liner. Uh, do you eat to live or to live to eat? If you eat to live, you practice, learning this in Ave Maria in your theology course, in the moral virtues, right? You practice the virtue of temperance. What is temperance? It's the moderate use of created goods. Aquinas, good definition, right? The moderate use of created goods. Temperance, it, it encapsulates uh, not simply eating, but the whole uh, dominion of our bodily appetites. Sexual appetite, eating appetite, <coughs> sleeping appetite, exercise. In other words, the proper use of our body. It's more panoramic or more global than just um, chowing down five hamburgers, okay? It goes beyond that. But do you eat to live or live to eat? So if we're, we're eating so as to live the temperance, but we're living only to eat, that's called gluttony. As Paul calls it, the god of the belly. <coughs> El Dios de la Panza, mm -hmm. the God of the belly, right? So the, op the opposite virtue, as we said, is that of temperance. Temperance, uh, eating with moderation. Nature says you should always get up with, all your, it's a good idea to get up with a little bit of hunger. I've never met anyone that's able to do that except St. Ignatius, right? No? Usually we're more than satisfied, huh? But these are the saints that really live, they, they live out the gospel of, of renunciation, right? Okay, let's move on to the next. Next is lust. Can I give you a definition? Yeah. Can I? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> lust is a disordered desire for sexual pleasure. You notice the word that I'm using is disordered, because okay? the sin is in disorder. 
In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, they define sin as disorder, taken from Aquinas once again, to, to disorder. <coughs> The opposite virtue opposed to lust would be purity or chastity. You can use both. Yeah, you can use both. They're both pretty good words. Okay, let's move on to the next. Avarice. Avarice or also is called greed. What's that? It's a disordered desire for material things. <coughs> Black Friday? Black Friday? There's a good one line from Eric Fromm, which I think you're really going to like. If you have, if you are what you have, and you lose what you have, then who are you? Try to say that in Polish, huh? <laughs> That's a good one, huh? So if you are what you have and you lose what you have, then who are you? Okay. What happened in 1929 on Wall Street? People were throwing themselves out the window because the, the stock crashed and people were committing suicide, right? If you like, our, our Polish friend John Paul II says it's more important being than having, and doing flows from being, right? JP2. Like that? It's more important, more important being than having, and doing flows from being who we are, right? Yep. I'm giving a mini course in philosophy today, huh? Well, okay, so the opposite virtue to avarice would be that of generosity, right? Generosity. You who are an English major, you're probably going to use the word, take from annotation number five of Ignatius, right? That's the tip of your tongue, right? Magnanimity, right? You're about to say that, right? Magnanimity, magna anima. What would be the opposite of magnanimity? It's on the tip of your tongue. It's pusillanimity. Okay. <laughs> Good word, huh? <laughs> magnanimity, pusillanimity. Are you pusillanimous? You maybe I said that at, 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 at the cocktail party, no? <laughs> <laughs> As the guest writes you, write you out a check for not 99 cents, 98 cents, right? <laughs> okay, then the, uh, then the next one would be that of, uh, of sloth or laziness. And it's, it's a resistance in our nature to carry out the hard work that our vocation demands. There's a certain resistance in our nature to carry out the hard work that our vocation demands. I mean, if we're going to live at our vocation, we've got to work hard. No pain, no gain, huh? I like the word, uh, you know, I like the word um, taken from physics. It's called inertia. You know, inertia. At least the definition they gave in New Jersey back in the 11th grade was an, an unmovable body needs exterior force so that it's put into motion. Did they say that in California or just in New York? Hmm? So if you've got a, an, like a rock on the top of a hill, unless there's an exterior force, it's going to stay there in ad infinitum until forever, right? Yep. We have that inertia within us because of original sin. Hmm? Any of you have any children? Did you ever have to tell them to do something more than once? <laughs> yes? Yes? That's called inertia, right? <laughs> you have to give them a swift kick, swift kick in the butt, right, so that they move, right? <laughs> okay, the 
opposite of sloth would be diligence. Laborosity. Used to, it used to be the, the American work, work ethic when my, my dad was working on Wall Street. Hard work. You know? Okay, then what about, uh, what, about, what about this one? Envy or jealousy. A little bit different, the two. Jealousy is this. I feel sad because someone has something that I don't have. A certain sadness. I feel sad because someone has something I don't have. We all have it one way or another. Envy is a little bit worse. It's, I feel sad because someone has something I don't have, and something bad happens to the person, I rejoice. Yeah. Ugly, isn't it? Isn't that ugly? Yes. But, but it's common. It's more common than you're aware of. No? Right? Corporate America? You're working, on, you're working in a company for 30 years. This young college graduate comes in. Within two months, he's making as much money as you are. The following week, he shows up three times late, and he's kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> Part of our nature, I think. Right? And whether we knit it, we, we all have that in one way or another, no? What would be the opposite? Oh, yes, but also admiration. Admiration. Instead of envying, you admire the talents that the person has and you compliment him, right? <coughs> If he's got gifts, they come from God anyway, right? All good gifts, all good gifts come from God, right? Yes. Uh, I have a question about sloth. What if the person has a condition that makes them less energetic, or they have medicine that makes them sleepy, or something like that? Great question. Um, the other day, I was listening to a talk on Saint Therese of Lisieux, and what you say, your, 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 your point is, uh, I, I'd like to write maybe, maybe a blog article on that, no? is every, every morning we have to get up and ask ourselves, with God's grace and, with God's grace and help, what can I do to please God and to, and to help others? It might be something very small. You arrive at a, a higher level of holiness, it might be simply to offer of your suffering to the church. You're, you're, right at, you're right at a very high level, um, you know, offering your, up your suffering as a victim soul. No? But, uh, for example, people, people, that, people that have handicaps, um, I, I try to encourage them, look, okay, you, you, you can't do what you did maybe 40 years ago, but there's other things you can do that are maybe even more pleasing to God. So if you have a, if you have a physical, mental, psychological limitation, have you ever heard the group Larsh? No. Larsh? Have you heard of it? It's a group uh, that was started by Jean Vanier in France, helping out the handicapped people. Henri Nguyen, who was a professor at Harvard University, uh, he ended up there in Canada, leaving his pr prestigious role as professor, and he, wor he, he lived in a community with retarded people. Retarded people. Today we'll call them down, but they're retarded. They're, they're, they're mentally challenged, as they say today, right? Mm -hmm. And he would go from one place to the next, giving his scholarly 
um, discourses. But he'd always take one of the handicapped boys with him. And um, he went to give a talk, and uh, the handicapped boy, his role was to turn the papers because he was reading his lecture. So once he finished one page, maybe the lecture was 10 pages, he'd have to turn it. And he'd be standing next to him. And during the course of the talk, uh, he, I think he'd come up and kind of hug Nguyen and sit. And he, when he was talking, he, he, the, the, the retarded boy would say, I've heard this before. <laughs> and then he said, and then he said Th this point I like, no? <laughs> now, 20 years later, if you remember that, that discourse, what's the only thing you're going to remember? Hello? They're not going to remember the, 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 the philosophical, theological discourse. They're going to remember the, the, the bond of love that existed between this retarded kid and this brilliant scholar. You understand? So what I'm saying is something that might be very small in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the world, might be very pleasing to God. If you ever want to see a good film, The Life of Vincent de Paul, it was done 60 years ago in black and white. Did you see it? None of you? Great movie. When he's dying, everyone in Europe wants to see him. And he discards the king and the queen. He says, no, bring me the most humble, simple postulant of the missionary, this servant of charity. And he said, by now, in my life, I know what's important. By now in my life, I know what's important. About a year ago, I had a really busy day. It was a Sunday. I thought I was on fire, you know, giving this talk and preaching at the 10 o'clock mass. I think I'm moving everyone. But I had a little break at about 4 o'clock, and I went to visit a house in Lakewood of a really poor woman, about 9 years old. She was poor, abandoned. I entered the house. It had a smell of urine. A cat fur, it's just kind of an ugly place. And I sat down next to this 90 year old woman and I smiled at her. Anointing of the sick and communion and confession, I gave her a little gift and I encouraged her. Then I went back to my apostolic zeal and my fire. Another talk, another mass. I was doing my examination of conscience at night. I said, Lord, I talked to the Lord, and talked to his friend. Weren't you proud of me today? <laughs> Weren't you proud of me today? Yeah, for one thing. Oh, that, what must have been a 10 o'clock mass with a thousand people there, no? How about those exercises with a hundred people there hanging on my words, no? How about the seven o'clock mass where I was giving a, an explanation of the prodigal son related to Dostoevsky? How about that? Yeah. <laughs> No, you really made my day when you visited that old abandoned lady. I said, Lord, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Got me? So what is, what is important in the eyes of the world may be despised by God. God reads the heart. Remember the widow's mite? The widow's mite, just a couple of copper coins that was more pleasing to God than the huge sums of money. So it's important to keep purifying our heart and always have purity of intention in everything we do. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'm going to be jumping over the last two, and you'll be able to meditate upon them in this book as well as my writings, because I want to, uh, I want to go back to explaining what, what is, I believe, to be the sin of the century and it's uh, the sin of lust. So I'd like to go through that. So what I'd like to do is this. With your permission, you give, you give me permission already a couple of times, okay? Is um, I want to give you a mini flash course on Orthodox uh, Catholic 
sexual ethics. So <laughs> it sounds like a, it is a tall deal, but I'm going to try to be as, uh, as systematic and clear as possible. Because never have we lived in a world with so much information. Never have we lived in a world with so much confusion. Okay? Right? right? We've never lived in a world with so much inf information. The highway, you can get it, whatever you want. But never have we lived in a world with so much confusion as, as now. Some of you who might be my age, you know, born in the 50s or earlier, who would have ever thought, who would have ever thought that you could go to hospital in California, Kaiser Permanente, you could go in as a boy, cut your beard, and come out as a girl. Oh, go in as a girl and come in and come out as a boy. Oh, I mean, if you said that back in the fifties or sixties, you would be the laughing stock of the whole company. No, you'd you 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 you'd, you'd, you'd be a an imbecile, an idiot. Excuse my English. No, you'd be seen as the laughing stock. Or nowadays. If you speak out against a person like that, you can maybe almost be thrown in jail, right? Mm -hmm. Because of sexual preference, right? Yeah. So I think that it's incumbent upon you to have a clarity as to the end and purpose of human sexuality. Otherwise, how many, how many parents here? Your kids are lost. If you don't have clarity on this, your kids are lost. Because in the universities, in the high schools, no? Just in the LA Times, you know, a week ago, they were promoting the transgenderism, starting with the third, the third graders, I think even younger, no? Which is being forced upon them. Preschool, yeah. So that I think that this, this topic is so important that if you, as I repeat, if you don't have clarity on this, you, your kids are lost. Don't be surprised that your son comes and says, Mom, I want to become a girl. No, don't be surprised, because that's the, the, the moral milieu atmosphere that we live in. No? So we have to have a real uh, great clarity on this topic. So let's, uh, let's try to give you as much as we can in the limited time. OK. First is human sexuality is good. Okay? God created everything as good. Whereas the evil, go back to principle and foundation, it's in the abuse of God's gifts. Either we use it or we abuse it. It's in the abuse. Everything that God created has a certain purpose. Right? If I take a hammer and I got a nail here and I pound it in the table, the, the hammer is doing what it's supposed to do, but if I take the hammer and I pound you over the head with the hammer, I'm abusing the hammer. <laughs> now you can apply that to anything, no? But especially to sexuality, no? Father Benedict Rochelle said that most people today carry a cross with not I N R I but S C X written on it. Okay? How many problems come because of an abuse of sexuality. How many, how many sexually transmitted diseases today? I'm not a doctor, but I know there's <laughs> huge numbers. Back in the 60s, it was, it was gonorrhea and syphilis. Those two are the biggies, right? And now, you, you mentioned it. And that's transmitted. Th those who get it, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not controlling your sexual appetite, you're not channeling your sexuality where it should be channeled with your husband and your wife, right? Yeah. So I'd like to first go through the abuses and then speak about what is the, what is the end and the purpose of human sexuality. So let's, let's hit the negative and end with the positive, okay? Okay. Start with our thought world. Is, uh, is it a sin to have bad thoughts? So yes. Yes? No. Okay. okay, this is the response. 
Listen, are you listening? Yeah. Okay, there's a, uh, a, ma a man that was talking with the priest, and the priest asked him, man, did you entertain bad thoughts? He said, no, they entertain me. <laughs> you got that? Now, if you remember that, uh, that joke, that uh, play in words, that explains it. If you, purposely, if you purposely entertain, it's bad. But if you have a bad thought and you reject it, you're practicing virtue. Okay? You're actually practicing virtue by rejecting it. But you have to, you have to reject. Part of the rules for discernment is to accept the good and reject the bad, right? Okay, let's go from, from there to... Um, this could be a challenge to us, but what about your speech? What about your speech? Do you, uh, is your speech, your words, your conversation, can you fail in that area too? Yes. Can you? Yes. So, you know, in purity in speech, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. You are uh, from immigrants in the United States, you know, using four letter words, you got to be careful. <laughs> A lot of them are bad, no? And telling a telling a bad joke. You know, you know me. I I I love to tell jokes. I've never told an off off color joke in my life, and I never will. Okay, never. I never have, and I never will. But I got a whole repertoire of jokes. But uh, l l let me tell you what happened in the life of John Bosco. There he is. Heard of John Bosco? John Bosco had a photographic memory. Do you? Only for bad things, right? <laughs> he had a photograph, as did Fulton Sheen, as did Aquinas, too. But when he's a priest... Years later, when he's a priest, he's maybe in his 60s, he complained that when he was about 10 years old, some man told a, a dirty story or joke, and he still couldn't get it out of his mind after 60 years. So we've got to be careful. You got to be careful. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus says. And I think we have to learn not to be impulsive or impetuous. We have to think before we speak, right? And I think, and then speak. And if you're agitated, you're in a bad mood. Maybe you get a watermelon, put it here for <laughs> on the Sunday. Put it there at least for. And then once you calm down, spit out the seeds, and then come out as a civilized person, not as a barbarian. <laughs> okay, let's move from there uh, to... Um, about speech then. This is a real challenge. If you're always with colleagues or relatives that are always uh, using bad language or dirty stories. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, you're doing the exercises, don't go out with them anymore. Yes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, some of you feel uncomfortable, maybe you feel I'm an extremist, but uh, don't think you're going to change them. Mm -hmm. They're going to change your way of thinking, your way of speaking. No? These exercises are made to transform us into saints. change our way of thinking, change our way of acting, and change maybe our social network too. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to uh, other areas. Let's go from the verbal, the mental, to the physical. If sexual, sexual is not practiced in the proper channel, okay, 
according to the Catech Catechism of the Catholic Church, you're, grieving, you're dealing with grave matter, okay? Mm -hmm. With grave matter. So let's go through the list. Even though modern psychology would be at odds with what I'm saying, I don't care. I'm going to teach you what the church teaches. Practice of masturbation, it's wrong. You hear me? Modern psychology, no, you shouldn't hold back your feelings, your impulses. It's wrong, okay? And, and read the number of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which explains it very clearly. We all have to learn how to control our emotions and our feelings. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that attaining chastity is a daily self-conquest. This is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's a daily self-conquest. You don't overcome your passions overnight. It's a daily work where you got to pray, you got to fast, you got to make your holy hour, you have to avoid the near occasion of sin, you have to watch over your eyes. In other words, it's a, it's a struggle. So this is the sin of the century. Living a life of chastity, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's very difficult. And unless we're aware of this in a, in a, in a presentation, the flesh is going to dominate us. We become slaves to our passions. Either we overcome our passions, we experience freedom, freedom of the sons and daughters of God, or we're driven by our passions. We live more on an animal level. Okay? Yes. You know? What? Yes. Yeah, we live more on an animal level. You know? We're not called to live on an animal level. We're called to live not only as human persons, but in sons and daughters of God. Let's move on, okay. Next would be fornication. Usually when I give this talk, half the people don't know what that is. Uh, do you know what that is? Yes. Happy? Okay, so another name for fornication would be premarital sex. That's wrong. Okay? Paul uses the word fornication in, in his list on, in Corinthians. Premarital sex. Now let's expound upon this a little bit more. You probably remember, Mary and Ed, when you were brought up and raised, that all of your friends, uh, teens or children, their parents, they're all married in the church. I don't remember, uh, I don't remember ever, um, half of my friends were Italian and Irish, that means a Catholic, and the others were Jews. I didn't remember any of them you know, not married properly back in the 60s. I don't, I don't remember any of them. Nor do I ever remember any of my Catholic friends missing Mass on Sunday because there was fear of the Lord. We, we didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> but nowadays, if I give a baptismal talk, Usually, Teresa will give it. I gave it for many, many years. Uh, before the church was, the old church was packed. We would have one 25 years ago. The Hispanics were having double the number of kids they're having now. Uh, most of them were married in the church. Now, I would say, I'd have to ask Teresa, I'd say maybe one out of four of the couples bringing their children to get married are married in the church. One out of four, one out of three, maybe in between the two. That's huge. So that's called permanent fornication, yeah. if you like the terminology. Permanent fornication. You, you, you can call it, there's a lot of, I'll give you a Roger Thesaurus, there's a lot of vocabulary in this. Cohabitation living together. Um, in New York, we say shacking out together. Shack out, no? Um, you have to see if you're... Uh, here's the big thing they say today. We have to see if we're compatible. Whether or not we got chemistry. <laughs> you got chemica, chemistry. Otherwise, you're going to explode in a short time. <laughs> 
You know, it's every Tom, Dick, and Harry, excuse my, excuse my English, every Tom, Dick, and Harry, he's got a trial marriage. In the meantime, they're crucifying Christ, and if they die, where do they go? Go to hell. So people are um, even getting civil in Catholic, young adult Catholics are getting civil in Catholic schools. Yeah. Yeah, they maybe go to Justice of the Peace, they go to maybe Las Vegas, uh, maybe with the intention to get married in the church, but it, it's it, it, often it's a trial marriage. We have to see. I, I've heard this. You know, marriage is a very serious commitment. I don't want to make a mistake. And, and they're living together for 20 years. Really? No, really. This is such a serious commitment that I don't want to, pre I don't want to precipitate it. In the meantime, they're living in 20, 20 years. They've got four kids. They're giving bad example to their children. And it doesn't dawn upon them that they, they, they have blind spots. Until I pull the blinders off their eyes, they keep living that. That's why Aquinas says lust blinds us. It blinds us. Okay, let's move on. Adultery. You've heard the word adultery, right? You know, I, I, I heard this interesting story. There was a uh, priest that was hearing a lot of confessions, and this uh, little kid comes in, he's eight years old, and he says, I lied, stole candy, punched my brother, stuck up my tongue in my grandmother. <laughs> And then, it happens, right, Angie? And then he said, in the end, uh, one more thing, Father, adultery. Eight, year, eight years old, adultery, it's getting younger and younger. <laughs> eight years old. Wow. And the priest asked the kid, adultery, what did you do? He said, I disobeyed the adult. <laughs> <laughs> There was a child that made his first confession. He made his first confession, and it was the first time the kid was going to confess. And he went face to face. So the priest was going to give him absolution. So the priest went like this to, kid, to give the kid absolution. Right away, the kid did this. Yeah! <laughs> High five. <laughs> Okay, so adultery is not disobeying adults. Let's, let's get the vocabulary right, okay? But it, it's uh, cheating on your spouse, <coughs> being unfaithful. Nowadays, it's more complicated than a hundred years ago. Okay, much more complicated. The, say 100 years ago, okay, you know, you cheated on your spouse, you had sex with another man or woman, okay? That's still, that, that's still possible and common. But it goes way beyond that. You can commit adultery um, mentally. You can. For example, you had, you, have, you, had a fight with, you had a fight with your husband, you're not talking, and you're thinking, where is Luisito now? Where is, where is Luisito, my ex-novio? Where is my, where is my ex-boyfriend now? Maybe he's walking in San Juan de los Lagos, there he is, taking a nice walk. And so you're, mad, you're daydreaming, you're daydreaming your, your ex-boyfriend. That's possible. We can use our imagination or we can abuse our imagination. We talked about that. Yep. How about this? You ready? Maybe at work you're flirting with another person. Hello? Coqueteando in Spanish? Hmm? 
You hear me? Very easy. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've done that. And tell you do the exercises, well, I really shouldn't have been doing that. I'm a married woman. It's a married man. You know, we both have marriage problems and we're, we're just, you know, we're, we, we thought we'd try to help each other to, to resolve our marriage problems. But, but see how the devil works? No, we're both them. We'll help each other to end up by falling in love with each other. And they're trying to resolve their marriage problems. It's common. And you know it's wrong. I'll give you an example. You know it's wrong, but you're having a cup of coffee with another person. And he or she does not show up one day. You're sad the whole day. Where is he? Is he sick? Better send an email to see if he's okay. <laughs> yeah, why didn't he come to work today? I better send him a little gift, otherwise he'll, he'll fall into Ignatian desolation, right? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be so, you see, see how the devil works. The devil could even use that. Yeah, that's right. They have to be charitable, yeah. The devil is so astute that if you, we don't watch over our hearts. For that reason, we'll be talking about this uh, as the course goes on. All of you have to have a spiritual director. You hear me? All of you have to, because if you don't talk this out with someone, what happens is you start to justify and rationalize what is, what is wrong. You say, well, you know, we're helping out each other. I have to be, uh, affability is one of the social virtues according to Thomas Aquinas, right? We have to be amiable, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, Alma? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 devil, the devil is an expert in language hmm? and uh, changing context and playing with our feelings working on our state of desolation. He's, he's an expert. He's been around a long time, right? And then, you know, you've you, you got to be careful with, with emails, okay? You've got to be really careful with emails. Um, send, you know, once you send an email, it's out there, you, like like a romantic word. It can go viral. It can go viral. What? In two minutes, this here has already arrived at Australia in a matter of, of one second. No. So I'm not saying that you have to be a prude or you have to be living in a cave. But we, t today, as Catholics, it's almost we have to walk like we're walking in a field of minds. No. Right, Eric? I really feel. Even for priests, even more so, pray for us. You know? <laughs> Boy, like you're walking in a field of mind. Every step you take, everyone is looking at us, what's happening in the church. You know? It's tough. So I know that a lot of people are praying for me. I got you know, my mother offering masses constantly. Yeah, I know. Otherwise, it's easy, for, it's easy for all of us to fall, right? All of us. There go I say the grace of God, right? But then there's another word, um, I don't know if you've heard it, uh, it's, there's new uh, uh, electronics media word that, that I'm learning, I'm, <laughs> I guess I'm betraying my age, called sexting. Have you heard that before? Se have you heard that? Sexting. It's like you send, you send a bad a picture of you. Is that what it is? Wow. If you do that... Well, it could be verbal or a picture that's done and that's out there until the end of time. Today you got a teenage daughter that's attracted. She she's, she uh, sends a, a picture to her boyfriend. He gets angry. He sends it all over the world. Yeah. Right? Isn't that possible? Yeah. So um, with the mass media, we got to be we got to be really careful. Really careful. 
And of course, one more step. This would merit a two-hour talk. Uh, maybe maybe a three. But I'm just saying it in passing because it has to be said. Is with respect to purity and sexuality, we have to be very dangerous because we live in a pornographic world. And all of you know that, no? Uh, I don't. I I don't like to talk about this topic, but it has to be mentioned, right? In my masses. Uh, probably three or four times a year. I give a homily in that, trying to adapt it to because you got children there. But um, sometimes I feel like I'm the only one crying out wolf. It's like you got an elephant in your bathroom. Is there an elephant in the bathroom here? Is it here? It's so obvious to be what, it's the biggest addiction in the country. What was that movie, uh, Forty Shades of Grey, was it? Yeah. Okay, 50. 50? Okay. 50? okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> what happened is one of her friends was asking her, wasn't that as good as to watch? And you said no, right? Okay. Uh, I, I, I heard reading a commentary on this that six, about 70% of those who went to see it were women. You know what that means? Now it's in the mainstream of all. Before this was just for men. No? Yes. Playboy, penthouse, you know, the, the dirty magazines behind the whiskey, you no know, back. No? <laughs> That's the way it used to be. And now women are becoming engaged in that too. Not as much as men, but it's picking up steam. Sad, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really degrades the dignity of the human person, right? So whether or not you like it or not, we're, we're living where we're, we're bombarded by this, no? You know, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I haven't watched TV for probably 20, 15 to 20 years because I just feel there's just a lot of trash. You know? um, but even if you're watching something like a, like a baseball game, the commercials, You want to take a mall with your take a walk in the mall with your kids in the summer day? How are people dressed? The ads too. Driving on the freeway. It's we're, we're living. Uh, that's why I think we have to consecrate ourselves to Mary, right? Amen. Yeah. Yes. Consecrate ourselves to Mary. So this would, this would of course merit a long talk. But I'll just throw that out there and pray that we would uh, we we would be freed of that. Um, that devil, I call it the devil. But constantly, we got to be vigilant. Oh, well, that's not a problem with me, but there could be some. You know, you, you know, you, you, for example, you, you go on a holiday, uh, you go to, on a holiday, Christmas or New Year's to visit some relatives, and then the TV. There you have it. And it's maybe it's uh, it's half time for football, and you see these. I don't have to explain it, but um, pray for the grace to be able to watch over our eyes, our mind, our hearts, and our souls. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's move on. Here is one of the most controversial topics in the United States, but I'm going to try to be as clear as possible. Let's talk a little bit about homosexuality okay, or lesbianism. <laughs> And then like, make some allusion to transgenderism. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, homosexuality and uh, lesbianism. Okay, the, okay listen. The, pra the practice of it, the practice of it, it's an abominable sin and it's against nature, against even natural law. Okay? So I'm saying the practice of it. A man having sex with man and a woman having sex with a woman, it's, uh, it's a very serious sin because it's against nature. So adultery is wrong, but a, a homosexual act is worse because it's even against the, the, the nature of the way God created man and woman to complement each other. Okay? Now, 
as the Catechism points out, if you have a man or a woman that has this condition, this would merit another two-hour talk that I don't have enough time, the origin of this would merit a long talk, then, okay, then the homosexual person or the lesbian has that condition, has to live a life of chastity. That means that they simply, they cannot... A woman cannot be living with a woman, a man cannot be living with a man, and forming, um, I don't like to say family or marriage because it really is not, okay? Uh, okay, I don't, I don't like to, any way possible to promote this as an institution that is pleasing to God. However, I'd have to say this. Say, for example, you have this man who, he's, he says, I'm, I'm homosexual. But I don't go to gay bars, I don't go to saunas, I don't go to beaches, I don't go to bathhouses, I don't go, I've never gone to that, but I've got a really strong tendency to be with another man, and I haven't given in to it, but I'm fighting against every day. That man can become a super saint. Or a woman, you know, I just, I like women, you know? you know, I just like women, but I haven't gone to any place where there's that, uh, that connection, even though I'm, I'm drawn to it every day. But I'm fighting against it. I pray. I fast. I'm establishing wholesome relationships. I'm going to daily Mass. But I tell you, I am drawn to that so strong. I haven't given in. That woman can be one of the greatest saints in heaven one day. Because it's a real battle. Okay, did you hear me? So though there, there's a considerable number of people that have that problem today, okay? And they can be, and I have to say, they can become great saints. But a man having sex with a man is wrong. Yeah. You hear me? Yes. And you, you people, you have to be clear on this because with your parties, half of your relatives are going to be supporting this. Yes. Um, maybe more, no? Uh, don't, do not get involved in emotional tirades with them, but try to use faith and reason. If it's just going to be shouting each other, that's, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, part of these exercises is, is, is to teach your people how to use faith and reason. Use your mind. Yeah. Right? A lot of it's common sense. Yeah, you come, you use, use your intellect. Mm -hmm. Now, if you really want to, I, I think this is a topic where it's worth studying and becoming more and more expert in this area. Okay? Um, the, 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 the best way to defend this, and um, there have been really good articles writing in defense of traditional marriage from Christians, from Focus on the Family, from good writers. But talking to a group like this, if you're talking, say, to a young person who's maybe going to college that feels that he's you know, the big shot, the big intellectual now, and now living with the parents, they're kind of old fogies, you know, archaic, obsolete relics of the past, no? I still feel that this argument is, is the best. Is, uh, what, what does God say about it? Okay, Sigmund Freud has got his idea, right? Okay, Freud has got his vision, right? There's the psychological. Malthus maybe has his. Okay. There are different philosophical schools that that uh, that have their that have their perspective. But what does God say about this? The very first book of the Bible says this: God created man and woman. Okay, man and woman. He created man and woman. A man will leave his father and mother. Father and mother. He will be united to his wife. What God has brought together, let no man rent asunder. That's from the book of Genesis. Do you know who quotes this? Jesus Christ. 
You hear me? It's from Genesis. But Jesus Christ in his teaching, he quotes this. You know who else? St. Paul in the Ephesians. So you got Genesis, you got Jesus and St. Paul. What more do you want? You know, uh, when I was in uh, seventh grade, I did, I mean, I, I started uh, studying public speaking when I was in seventh grade. It was Mr. Postum back there in, in Jersey, you know. A few things I remember, and this was fit more than 50, about 50 years ago. He said, learn when you're speaking, don't use vocalized pauses. You know what that means? Um, 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 or Spanish, este, 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 um, um, um. That, that's, that's bad speaking. Okay, second is, you can either have the wandering eyes when you're teaching or focus on one person. But not the person that's falling asleep because you become discouraged, but someone that's really paying attention to you. <laughs> that encourages you. Now this is 50 years ago, but the, the last thing I remember is this. When you're preaching and teaching, or like in debating, look for the weak point and go for the kill, the juggler vein. Yeah. Look for the weak point. The kill is heal, go for the kill. <laughs> like a boxer? Cinderella man, look for it, no? Max Bayer? Yeah, <laughs> great movie, huh? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if he hits a fastball, how about a, how about a slider? How about a curve? Wrong letters? Nah, outside corner, no? Uh, keep away from the brush back pitches, right, Ed? No? Okay. So, uh, this is, this is, what, this is what, 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 what they taught. The power of the argument depends upon the authority of the source. You hear that? Yep. The power of the argument depends upon the authority of the source. So if I say, you know, my friends, uh, Joe Smith said this uh, on the corner of, of Carson and Norwalk. Huh? <laughs> Joe Smith happened to be my grandfather, but that's not that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty common name, right? My, my mom's dad, okay? But if I were to say, According to Aristotle, more powerful? According to William Shakespeare in Macbeth. According to Dante in the Divine Comedy. According to T.S. Eliot in The Wasteland. So I'm quoting very authoritative sources from philosophy and literature. There's power. But what if I say, according to the book of Ezekiel, how about 1 Corinthians 13, St. Paul, on love? How about Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. So the more authoritative the source, the more powerful the argument. Amen? So uh, I would say, I mean, there's many ways to approach this, but I think that that, Someone might, say, someone might say to you, well, I don't really believe in God. I would, I would retort saying, okay, but you have a double doctorate from Yale and, and, and Harvard. You know, the, the Bible is the most, most well-known book in the world. You, you simply discard that. That's a sign that, of your ignorance, even though you've got a double doctorate. Right? We can't deny that it's the most famous book in the world. No? Uh, so if you, if you really want to do some study, study up on abortion, but study also on this fact. Because the two big dangers of this society are abortion and the widespread proliferation of homosexuality and transgenderism. One kills the innocent baby, the other is going to destroy the family. I was reading an article the other day. If if there is so much sexual, sexual confusion, this could ruin our country. It could easily ruin our country. These two things, killing the baby and destroying the family. If you ever study world history, how do the fam when, when do the societies fall apart? When the family falls apart. The Greco-Roman society, the, I mean, any great society fell apart because the family was being rent asunder. 
JP2 called the family the basic building block of society, right? The domestic family. The domestic church is a family. Yes? widespread and promoting um, uh, abortion, LGBTQ. Why isn't there, for many, many decades, as long as LA Times has been, why isn't there um, a voice that publishes as widespread as LA Times and CNN or whatever else, these verses from Genesis, Jesus, and so on? Well, because be, the reason why is because a lot of people that work for the press they want money, they're secular, mm -hmm. they're paganistic, they're materialistic, Liberal. they're liberals, mm -hmm. uh, they, and they don't accept, they don't accept that. A, a lot behind abortion and Planned Parenthood is money, is money. Why can't Because um, we're in the minority, but okay, let, good, good point, let's, let's work on it. I think there's a lot of positive things. Um, for example, Relevant Radio, EWTN, Radio, Radio Guadalupe. No? Um, I, I, I've actually been on those three. I have been. No? I've been on EWTN. I've been on Relevant Radio several times. I'm, I'm, now they're asking me in Relevant Radio in Spanish. So they're starting that. They're asking me to go in. in well, I'm just on the phone. Uh, so. It's a way in which we're touching thousands of people. I write books. You can get one if you want. No, so spread. I think we have to try to spread the word of God, whatever, whatever way possible, whatever way possible. So, this little group. If all you people become great saints, what's going to happen? Fifty of you become saints. You're going to change the world. You hear me? You know, I'm not saying that as a as a pious platitude or a cliche. You're called to become a saint. You are too. You, you too. You're called to be a saint. We're all called to become saints. The biggest tragedy in the world would be if we don't become a saint. That's the big tragedy. Not losing money or your big house or your Maserati. Cares. Biggest tragedy is not becoming a saint. Because all of you are called to become a saint. So am I. No? So working day and night, and the exercises help us to become saints. These are the building blocks, right, Mary, of becoming saints. Okay. Um, listen to this also. So I'm, I'm trying to hit all the different uh, mini topics within human sexuality. Okay, 1968, uh, the moral... Ecclesial atomic bomb exploded. And it was. Da 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 da! Da 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 da! Da 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 da! You're all going to be getting this. Okay, 1968, Pope Paul VI convened a group of experts to study the topic of the pill. We call it birth control. Almost all of those who are present in this meeting, which was first started by John the 23rd, but he died. So it was kind of hanging in limbo. Teachers, professors, doctors, experts, they were all in favor of utilizing the pill as a means of limiting population growth. And I've talked with Mary about this many times. It seems to be she was a sociology major. What a joke that they're predicting around now that there's not going to be space on planet Earth for people. We're going to be standing on each other's shoulders. What a ludicrous joke. Have you, any of you ever been in a plane? Have you? Did you ever look down? If, if there's, if, have you ever looked down when there's sun out? 92% is green and brown. What does that mean? Hello? In Mexico, too. 92% of this country is still, it's still not, uh, not being used. 
So that's, that, that's a, the sociology, excuse me, pie in the sky idealism, no? Hmm? That was, that's, that was the backdrop of this. We're gonna have so many people in the year 2050, there's not gonna be enough room. You know, all the people in the world could fit in the state of Texas. Okay, Patrick Madrid was at a, as a, at a topic and one man said, he was like a, a doctor, he said all the people in the world could stay, fit in one county in Michigan. You remember that? So, you know, there's about, there's about close to 8 billion. I mean, they're not gonna have a lot of space, no? So, be careful of these lies that are being pumped out, these lies. So let's get back to the topic. So it looked as if they're going to allow for the use of contraception. But there is a, this is Paul VI now, there's a key person in that meeting that turned the tide. And he was a man from Poland. And his name was Karol Wojtyla. Did you ever hear of him? No. Not yet? No. Who's Karol Wojtyla? Okay, he was. He was born in he was born in 1920, right? May 18th. So he was 48 years old. He was already he was already Archbishop of Krakow, okay? Okay, and he said, he said, Your Holiness, it's wrong. So he wrote Love and Responsibility, an acting person, two of his great classics that you've probably read many times, right? And what happened was the promulgation of this moral atomic bomb. Summary of it, every marital act has to be open to the possibility of life. Therefore, any use of artificial means is intrinsically disordered. Wow. What's that? Nice, nice right? Beautiful words, right? Yeah. Every marital act has to be open to the possibility. Therefore, any use of artificial means, we call conscious of, is intrinsically disordered. Intrinsically means by its very nature, by its very essence. Catechetically, it's a mortal sin. When that was published, my friends, all hell broke loose. From that moment, the church has been divided. That's the watershed moment in the United States. Look at the church today. But that was the key moment. Because up to that point, basically the priests and the bishops were united. Today, not only is the church divided, the church is shattered. How's your English? Hmm? Divided is one thing. Shattered or splintered, is a, that's, a, that's a key word that I'm using now. No? You know, the poet says, no one is an island unto himself. Every parish is an island unto himself today. It's sad that I say this. So you might go to one priest, as confessory says this, and you go to another priest, Maybe go one to the priest and he says, you say, well, I've got four kids and I don't get along well with my husband and we've been fighting, we don't have too much room. And, oh, and the priest says, well, what's important is that you love, is that you love. Love is what's most important. So, Father, can I use the pill? Of course, what's important is that you love. <laughs> then they come to me. Oh, you got four kids, huh? <laughs> Why didn't you have another four? I'm one of nine. None of us died of hunger. There's no reason why you shouldn't have another kid. So two priests, they're totally different. And that's the church today. The church is, divided. The church is, is shattered. So you have to go to the parish of the church where you feel you're being fed, you're fed best. Right? Yes. Where are you feeling being fed best? That's where you should be going. You might have to travel. Okay. So that was, the, that was the watershed moment. And you people, you know, even though it's hard, you people have to read, understand, and accept this. Will you? Yes. Hello? Yes. You have to read. You have to try to understand it. Maybe read. You can read it in 40 minutes. Okay. It's, it's, it's very short. 
I always say read it a couple of times, and I've given you a, a succinct summary of it. But there's many other. Another number is very interesting. It says all, all the prophecy of what Paul Paul the Sex says, of what's going to happen, what's going to happen if we don't obey this. It makes a prophecy. I think it's number 37, which is almost scary. Now this is uh, this is uh, 40, almost 42 years since, and you see it coming to reality to the T. 42 years ago. 42 years ago. Okay, uh, so what is, the, what is the solution? The solution is not, uh, it's not s safe sex, but sacred sex. Okay, and we do not believe in birth control, but in self-control. Amen? Amen? Not safe sex, but sacred sex between Here's the teaching of the church. Sexuality is good. That's how we enter into the world. It's good only when you have a man and woman. Okay. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, right? Okay. A man and a woman that are married in the church, not in Las Vegas, or a civil marriage. Okay. Married in the church. Okay, And... The marital act has two basic purposes, which are mutual gift of self, the words of John Paul II, the mutual gift, gift of self in the marital act, but also openness to procreation. Those are the two basic functions which are explained in Humana Vitae also. In John Paul II and the theology of the body he really expounds upon this in greater detail. So mutual love between husband and wife in the marital act, number one. And second is you have to be open to the possibility of life. So if you feel that you really have to avoid children because you got 12 kids and there's no more wrong in the house and your husband is not working, okay, you gotta, you gotta wait a little bit maybe, okay? Space them out. How? By accepting what? This, the, the, the natural cycle that God has placed in the woman. No? Women are fertile. Women have to know that. And it's kind, of, it's kind of ironic that sometimes I have to teach a woman her fertile cycles. No, I, why do I have to do that? You're the woman. I'm a celibate priest. No, But I, I have to do that. No, it's embarrassing. Well, you know it's not embarrassing because that's the way God created you. If you don't know it because of gross neglect, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. But you should, yeah, you, you go, because I, I, NFP is so important. We got some of the best NFP teachers in, the, in, in LA here in this parish. My baby sister is an NFP, NFP teacher, graduate from Steubenville. She's been teaching it for many years. And she teaches NFP. She already has eight children. But that's the only solution, is having recourse to earn fertile periods in your cycle. You're simply following natural law. You're not tampering with nature, but you're following natural law because God is the author of everything. God created laws. Biological laws, physical laws, inertia, gravity, but also he created that monthly cycle that he's placed in the woman. How beautiful that is. And I can win, win over the, the American feminists. You're polluting, polluting feminine ecology. Amen? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Because the feminists, the you know, feminists of the 60s, they like the idea of ecology. How about the fact you're polluting feminine ecology? So these are, the, these are topics. These are topics that I, I've gone through about 10 key topics on sexuality. Have you been following me? Was this helpful? Yes. Okay, so let's pray that we really know it well. And to be able to live this out, we can't do it without God's grace. You got to pray fervently. You have to receive the sacraments, especially the Eucharist and confession. And a key way that we can live out our sexuality the way God wants us is to have great love for the Blessed Mother, right?
have great love for Mama Mary, right? For the Virgen Guadalupe. If we do that, we'll be able to live out that beautiful beatitude, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, which is, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. God bless you and have a great Christmas. Okay? Thank you, Father.